So, does anyone play Warframe? I actually played this game less than a year after release in late 2013, dropped it after a few weeks after getting bored, then picked it up again about five years ago, and I've been playing it sporadically ever since. A big part of the reason why I came back and actually became very fond of it is that the lore is actually pretty wild. I want to try and explain it. Most of this is actually not presented to the player immediately, so there are major spoilers for main story quests here. I'll let you know when I'm about to hit the major spoilers, so if you want to actually play the game, you can abandon ship. Okay. So the premise of Warframe begins with the Orokin. The Orokin were a highly stratified empire that became the predominant power in our solar system, called the Origin System, at some point in the distant future. Exact dates are a bit of a mystery. The Orokin had the most decadent of decadent societies, ruled by a virtually immortal aristocracy obsessed with ostentatious luxury and enforcing their dominion from their seat of power on Earth's moon, Lua, which is honeycombed with their structures. The Earth had become uninhabitable due to its toxified atmosphere. I will stress here that the Orokin were human if taken to a perverse extreme. The elite classes of the Orokin, the only true Orokin in their eyes, would extend their lives through a process called continuity. When they grew old or simply desired a new body, the Orokin would have the young, beautiful, and exotic paraded before them in a ceremony called a Yuvan. Those brought before them had no say in the matter. Some may even have been children seized from their parents' arms. When they made their selection, they engaged continuity, using the mind-altering properties of a substance called Kuva to destructively transfer their consciousness into the new bodies, destroying the consciousness of their former owners. This Kuva is a principal symbol of Orokin rule. Being masters of bioengineering, they would even drastically modify their bodies to suit their own fashions, at a late point, the fashion was evidently bluish skin and a single, elongated arm. Protected by the elite Dax, enhanced warriors conditioned to obedience, the Orokin kept the most advanced technologies for themselves, and harshly punished anyone that transgressed their laws or challenged their rule. Some might be obliterated by a mysterious execution method called the Jade Light, but others might have their consciousness broken and stripped from their body, to be turned into a cephalon, an intelligence forced into perpetual servitude to the Orokin. The Orokin also maintained a purpose-engineered, enslaved labor force of clones called the Grenier. In time, the Orokin grew obsessed with the idea of expanding their dominion beyond the solar system and so came their research into the Void. This mysterious trans-dimensional realm made many feats of Orokin engineering possible, powered by a device called the Heart on the Martian moon Deimos. They constructed towers and structures hiding great treasures within the Void, accessible only through their gateways. The solar rails, placed throughout the solar systems, trivialized travel by allowing ships to move the distance between them with incredible speed. So finally, they planned for the experimental void jump ship, the Zeromin 10 to jump the gap between systems and expand the Orokin Dominion. Since we clearly have not learned the lessons of Event Horizon or Warhammer 40k, that if your FDL tech requires traveling through another dimension, it might be a very bad idea. So, something went wrong. While attempting to enter the void near Saturn, the ship disappeared. It was a catastrophe and a humiliation that the Orokin moved swiftly to cover up. So they were surprised when it reappeared some time later, with everyone aboard dead or gone. All of the adults, anyway. The Orokin had other schemes for expansion. 
namely the creation of self-replicating terraforming machines to be deployed to the Tau system, where they would make it ready for the Orokin. Given the complexity and enormity of the task, the Orokin gave them a high degree of adaptability and resilience, this despite the misgivings some of the Orokin, who had always avoided creating truly artificial intelligence. These tools would gain sentience, and at some time after their arrival in Tau, they came to realize that the Orokin would make a ruin of it as they had the origin system. Eventually, they, now called the Sentients, would embark to return to the Orokin system and destroy their creators. The Orokin were unprepared. The heavily automated defenses their armies depended on, besides the Dax, were easily subverted and turned against them. Where machines failed, they turned to flesh as their weapon. They militarized the Grenier slave clones to bolster their forces, to little effect, but they had more devious tools. The infestation, as it is known, is a biomechanical pathogen created by the Orokin in the past, previously tested on the blighted Earth, but shelled after they had trouble controlling it. It would subvert biological matter and, over time, even start to convert metal and other non-biological substances into a pseudo-organic mass. From these, it would create fantastic and monstrous creatures and mutations. The sentients were immune to the infestation, but the Orokin would adopt a scorched earth policy of unleashing the infestation on their own outer colonies, hoping to bog the sentients down in gardens of death. Even this was only somewhat effective. The tide would only begin to turn when the Orokin introduced a new kind of warrior. The Tenno, highly capable warriors that used biomechanical weapons called Warframes, created from a specialized strain of the infestation. Each Warframe model had its own unique powers, alongside the weapons they wielded. With a suite of tools made available to them, from servant Cephalons to purpose-built spacecraft, the Tenno took the fight to the Sentients, for they could wield the power of the Void, which the Sentients were vulnerable to. Though the Sentients were at the doorstep of Lua, the Tenno pushed them back and defeated them. So the old war ended, and the Tenno were summoned to be honored by the Orokin. Thus was the day of the Great Betrayal, when the rulers of the Orokin raised them up, and all the Empire praised them. Then, in the space between heartbeats, a torrent of blood was spilled in the halls of the Orokin, as the Tenno killed the rulers of the human race. It was a slaughter, and it didn't end there. The Orokin Empire collapsed without the majority of humanity having any understanding of why the Tenno did it. The Tenno themselves would disappear, sealed away in slumber for centuries. During the collapse, a pair of Orokin, twin sisters, led the cloned slaves, the Grenier, in revolt. Coming to be worshipped by the Grenier as the twin queens, they would establish a new empire and would become one of the predominant powers of the post orokin era. Successive generations of cloning have caused genetic degeneration among the Grenier, necessitating commonplace cybernetic enhancements to replace failing body parts. They eventually began exerting their military force, built on comparatively crude ballistic weapons and ships, to assert their empire and begin scavenging the treasures of the Orokin. They would have competition in that. The Corpus is one part megacorporation, one part religious cult. They literally worship Prophet and the Void. Established before the fall of the Orokin, the Corpus accumulated profit and influence through trade and industry. Their founder was so successful that even the Orokin were forced to give him some degree of respect, much as they distrusted any power that was not granted by their own hand. As such, the Corpus were denied the true wonders of Orokin technology, but they persisted as the Orokin fell, ultimately establishing points of influence around the system. They did business with the Grenier for many years, profiting off the expansion of their domain, 
but their relationship would eventually fall apart as they competed for power in the Origin system. This was the world that the Tenno would reawaken into, even as the Grenier and Corpus attempted to exploit the sleeping Tenno to their own ends. Guided by a mysterious figure called the Lotus, the Tenno began fighting the powers of the Origin system, protecting those exploited by Corpus Greed and Grenier Despotism. What I've just described is roughly how the lore stands when Warframe starts, but I want to dig a bit deeper into the Tenno, who they are and why they fought. This is where I'll be delving into spoilers, so if you have any inkling to play this game and be surprised, this is your chance to bail out. This will include story spoilers up to the New War quest. Okay. First, I will address the Warframes themselves. They aren't suits of armor that the Tenno step inside, as the player is led to believe initially. Each Warframe model was created by infecting a human with a specialized strain of the infestation, called Helminth. These were often the best and strongest bodies the Orokin could find, willing or not, and occasionally used as a cruel punishment. This curated strain mutated them, made their bodies powerful weapons, but it broke their minds and they became uncontrollable. They were failures. The best the Orokin could do was unleash them on the battlefield in the general direction of the sentience. We took our greatest, volunteers or not, and polluted them with these cultured reagents. They transformed. They became infested. But only just. Their skin blossomed into sword steel. Their organs interlinked with untold resilience. Yet their minds were free of the infested madness. Or so we thought. We set them upon the battlefield. Biodrones under our command. The Warframes. All of them failures. Surprised? They turned on us, just as you did. And so we had no choice but to commit them to grave. This would be the case until the development of transference technology, which would allow an operator to control the Warframe remotely. That brings us to the Tenno themselves. The origin of the Tenno lies with the Zeraman 10 disaster, the failed jump ship might have ushered Orokin Dominion to the stars. Instead, the would-be colonists were trapped in the Void. The adults went insane under the Void's influence, becoming feral and murderous even toward their own children, who, for some reason, were unaffected. The children survived by means of a bargain with a mysterious entity known as the Man in the Wall, the specifics of which are still unknown. The children gained strange and inexplicable powers, and they were forced to kill their insane parents. When the Zeramin reappeared in the Origin system, the Orokin found the children and hid them away as they tried to sweep the whole incident under the rug. They came into the care of an Orokin researcher named Margulis. She cared for the children even came to love them, despite being hurt and blinded during experiments to control their powers. They were tormented by the trauma of all they had experienced aboard the Zeraman. Margulis shielded them from those memories and developed transference technology allowing the children to project themselves into surrogate bodies. This initially intended as a therapeutic technique, presumably to somehow distance themselves from their uncontrolled abilities. They were placed in somatic link chambers on Lua, where they would experience life as a sort of lucid dream. Dream. Not of what you are, but of what you want to be. This was not according to the will of the Orokin, however. Being embarrassed by the incident and disturbed by the surviving children's powers, the Orokin ordered them destroyed. Margulis disobeyed them, and so she was executed. So shame on you! 
You are a kid. So perfect on the outside, but you're prodded through and through. Seven hands raised. For your apostasy, the judgment is death. Margulis, why? Honored Seven, we have gathered here today to carry out the sentencing of our comedian Margulis. You face the Jade Light, recant, and we will grant our merciful death. My daughters, my sons, I want you to know my last thoughts are of you. It was Margulis' lover, Ballas, the creator of the Warframes, who had attempted to dissuade her from defending the children of the Zeremin, that ultimately brought the Tenno into being, which is ironic considering his hatred for them, blaming them for Margulis' death. Using transference technology, they could do something nobody else could, pacify and control the Warframes. The Tenno, as they came to be known, were trained into a new class of warriors, channeling their void powers through Warframe surrogates while they themselves slept at the reservoir on Lua. This is why, when the Tenno's true form is revealed in the second dream quest, they appear to be teenagers. The Tenno turned the tide against the sentients, but there was a wrinkle. One sentient, called Nata. She was a sentient mimic, capable of changing her form, which she used to infiltrate. Her task was to turn the Tenno against the Orican by taking a form resembling Margulis. What happened next is honestly kind of murky. The developers have been playing with the unreliable narrator trick with recent content, so what happened with Nata is uncertain. The original explanation players were given was that Nata developed maternal feelings for the Tenno, having become unable to produce her own offspring due to her exposure to the Void, returning to the origin system. She took on the identity of the Lotus, a benevolent and loving figure to the Tenno. Thus, she fulfilled her mission by turning the Tenno against the Orican, but refused to carry out its final phase, to kill the Tenno, instead hiding them away while the Orican Empire collapsed. What confuses this is that in recent content, Nata claimed that she was captured and brainwashed to become the Lotus by the Orican to help manipulate the Tenno. On one hand, this is after literal years of gaslighting and manipulation by Ballas and her sentient brother Era. On the other hand, that maternal feelings explanation always seemed a little weak to me. However, this explanation doesn't really explain why the Tenno went on to purge the Orican leadership, since Nata's mission was overwritten. Unless, of course, the Tenno did that on their own, which they certainly had enough reason to. Again, though, all this could just be lies. In any case, Nata became the Lotus and hid away the Tenno, only to wake them up centuries later when the Grenier and the Corpus began looking into exploiting them. Also, many players fondly refer to the Lotus as Space Mom. By the transitive property, Hunhao, leader of the sentience that created Nata, 
is Space Racist Grandpa. Now hang on to your seats because things are about to get more convoluted. In the new war quest, the Orokin Ballas, the creator of the Warframes who actually betrayed the Orokin to the Sentients, teamed up with the remnants of the Sentients in a bid to basically make himself God King of the Origin System using mind control technology. His strategy for getting rid of the Tenno was to lure us into a trap and throw us into the void. The Tenno came back though, sort of, a version of us anyway. So Warframe brings up this concept of eternalism. The idea is that all potential events occur. Every past, present, and future exists and is accessible if one knows how. This isn't a matter of different timelines, however, since that implies chains of causality. Causality, however, is an illusion. Yeah, if this sounds confusing and unclear, that's because it is. In any case, meet the Drifter. The Drifter is a version of your Tenno that was not rescued from the Zeramin, instead growing older in a paradoxical void space called Duviri. The Drifter appears when our Tenno, called the Operator to distinguish them from the Drifter, is tossed into the void by Ballas. The Drifter can't initially use Warframes or Tenno abilities, but wages a covert war against Ballas to restore the Lotus. By the time Ballas is defeated, the Drifter has gained Tenno powers and is able to switch places with the Operator, though they are still separate beings and they don't share memories or anything like that, they just can't occupy the same time and space at the same time, or something. So to recap, as a Tenno, you are one part highly trained traumatized child soldier, one part product of a Faustian bargain with an eldritch being, with eerie powers to turn invisible and project energy, amongst other things. You might also not be able to die. Actually, you just vanish and return to your Warframes in-game. That's why Ballas tried throwing you into the void to get rid of you. Also, one part temporally entwined with an alternate version of yourself, and at your disposal, a small army of walking war crime dispensers that are, in and of themselves, the result of horrifying human experimentation. What. The. Hell. Yeah, it's a lot. I haven't even explained this little shop of horrors reject living in your ship. That's all for now. I wanted to try this sort of more casual video for a franchise I might not want to cover in depth, but still want to touch on. Warframe is pretty unique, and it's become one of the games I keep coming back to, so I hope you enjoy my sharing its craziness. I'll see that I get up more Bioware content next time. Have a nice day.